We need to be reminded of that more often, don't we? There is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. And it was written by a man, William Cooper, who struggled with depression and very troubled in his mind, but he took comfort in those truths that 
The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Thank you, Josephine. Very, very helpful to be reminded of that. We're going to go to 2 Samuel tonight. 2 Samuel 7. And continue our study in the life of David here. 2 Samuel 7. It's also mirrored, not quite mirrored, I'd say echoed in 1 Chronicles 17, so we'll be checking in there as well along the way. Before we start this evening, I'd like us to go to the Lord and ask Him to open our eyes. I particularly feel feel the need for His help tonight as we look at this passage. Let's pray. Lord, we come to You and ask Lord, that you would open our minds, open our eyes to the truth that you have for us. Lord, open my mouth to speak clearly what you have for us. And Lord, I pray that you would do your work tonight and that we would be drawn nearer to you, more thankful, more amazed by your grace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Samuel 7 says in verse 1, Now it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the Lord, the ark of God, dwells inside tent curtains. Then Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But it happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name, like the name of great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and have no more And move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. Since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. Also, the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. Now, this chapter, when we put this all together in David's life, um, trying to figure out when did this actually happen. There's a lot of debate here, and I'm going to spare you all of the details here. But I believe that, this, that these verses took place early in David's life, mostly because of verse 12 and some other reasons here. God says, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your own body. So it seems that, abs- that uh, Solomon has not yet been born yet. The Hebrew, you could get into all of the Hebrew technicalities there of the future and all of that. Um, I believe that Solomon has not been born yet. David has been victorious over his enemies to a, to a great extent. I don't believe that David has completely, um, that he has completely finished his wars, okay, um, but it's early in David's life enough that Solomon's not been born yet and late enough that there has been some great victories and God can say to David, 
that I've given you rest from your enemies. Um, and uh, this passage, you may have guessed, you might have a heading at the top of your chapter here, chapter 7, God's covenant with David is what my Bible says. This passage is going to tell us about a covenant. Now, theologians have done us the favor of giving them very technical names, okay, covenants. There is the Adamic covenant, Adamic covenant, the covenant with Adam, okay? There's the Noahic covenant. Doesn't that sound fun? The Noahic covenant. That's from Noah, Noah, Noah Hick, Noah Hick, all right? Abrahamic sounds like something that hangs in your backyard, right? Between two trees, Abrahamic. But uh, that is the covenant with Abraham, um, uh, the Sinaitic covenant. That's the covenant at Sinai. And what do you think they call this covenant? The Davidic covenant. I'm not going to call it the Davidic covenant all night because I, I really want it to be fresh in our minds that this is not just the Davidic covenant, okay? And sort of shoehorn your, your theology chapter in here, okay? And you sort of skip over that uh, because this covenant is a very special covenant. And the question, as I looked at this and studied this, what does this covenant have to do with us on Easter Sunday, 2023? Okay, you found out, okay, we're studying the Davidic covenant tonight, you know. Are, are we excited yet? You know, but what does it have to do with us on Easter Sunday, 2023? The answer is literally everything. Literally everything. The Davidic covenant... I, there, I just said it. I, sorry, I slipped. Okay, uh, the, the covenant with David um, has everything to do with us today, and it has all kinds of relevance for our lives. I have three points this evening. The first one is that God longed to build God, that God lo David longed to build God a cedar house. Okay, we saw that. Um, he said, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. Implied, I want to build God a house of cedar. I want to build God a palace. David wanted to build God a cedar house, but God built David an eternal house. The title of the message tonight is David's eternal house. God built David an eternal house. He says that to David in, in verse 11. Also, the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. He will make you a house. Now, David already dwelled in a house of cedar, right? But God says, I will make you a house. And then the third point, and I really hope that this brings it home to us this evening, we're going to see that God invites sinners to a banquet in David's eternal house. God invites sinners that's you and me, to a banquet in David's eternal house. And we are here tonight because of these verses. These verses have everything to do. This is why we're here tonight, uh, because Dave, God made this covenant with David. These verses tonight demand a constant response from us of worship. And we'll see later on in this chapter David's response to the Lord. But they demand a constant response from us, one that is probably overdue tonight. You probably have not worshipped God because of His covenant with David enough in your lifetime. So may God help us to do that tonight. First of all, David longed to build God a cedar house. God had delivered David from years and years of turmoil. Just let your mind roll back through David's history and you'll see that David had been chased all over the country like a rat. Saul had run all over the country looking for David, slaughtering people, slaughtering towns um, in search of his arch enemy who was actually his most loyal friend. David had stared death in the face constantly in his life. David now sat in a house of cedar in the nation's new capital. Now, a house of cedar was a big deal. Cedar does not rot. Um, my siding on my house is cedar, and uh, it has lasted a long time. Incidentally, you're not supposed to paint cedar, Paul Beck tells me, and I agree with him because it chips all the time. Um, but David's house was not painted cedar. It was probably natural cedar, um, and it lasts. Cedar lasts forever. It also smells pleasant, doesn't it? Um, you ever uh, smell the, the cedar chips or inside of a cedar chest? A lovely smell there. David now is not chased all over the country he dwells in his own house of cedar. 
God had delivered David from years of turmoil. God was establishing Israel permanently after years of turmoil. You look at the book of Judges and you see this tumultuous, uncertain time for Israel. You've read the book of Judges before and it's like the spin cycle on your, your washing machine. Just around and around and around we go and the, it, rebellion and rebellion and, and then uh, the, the punishment of the Lord, the chastening of the Lord and then the repentance and then the deliverer and then the rebellion again and just over and over and over. A very uncertain time for Israel. There were constantly... Uh, oppression of their enemies because of their rebellion. And yet God had promised Abraham a nation and a homeland. We'll see this later in Genesis 12. He says, I will make of you a great nation. He, was, he would give Abram a land to dwell in. The time period of Saul was a tumultuous time as he threatened to wipe out his own countrymen. He consulted with witches and there was this stench after Saul's death of spiritual wandering all over the land. I mean, Saul did not follow the Lord. You had a bunch of priests that had been wiped out up in the territory of Nob. The people terrified for their lives, not sure what's going on. And Saul's death, you remember this, the Philistines literally punched a hole through the, through the territory of Israel, punched a hole all the way to the Jordan River. And Israel now is divided Spends years trying to sort itself back out. But now God is establishing Israel permanently after years of turmoil. David has just moved the capital city from uh, Hebron to Jerusalem. He's conquered the city of Jerusalem. And just an amazing story as he sets up his capital there. You have the ark of God uh, being moved to Jerusalem. And the people begin to worship uh, the Lord there in Jerusalem. David is consolidating. There's a unity happening in this land. And David wants God to be established. David wants God to be established. And I put established in quotation marks there because God is always established. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. God, everything about God is established. But there's a sense here in which it's important to understand that uh, in the, the ancient Near East, a king's sovereignty was not fully established or recognized until he had constructed an appropriate dwelling place. I believe David's house was built early on there at, at Jerusalem as he's consolidating his power over a united country. And he says, I dwell in this house of cedar, but God dwells, the ark of God dwells in these curtains. David had prepared a tabernacle for the Lord there in Jerusalem, but God still dwelt in curtains. They were probably beautiful curtains, but they were, they were not satisfactory. David's established as king of Israel, and he wanted to publicly establish Jehovah as his God. David had already begun organizing teams of people. We read about this in 1 Chronicles 17. Hundreds of people probably uh, beginning to begin to revolve around Jerusalem, and the worship of Jehovah is set up there in permanence. And David says to Nathan the prophet, which by, by the way is the first time you see Nathan the prophet mentioned here. I want to build God a place of dwelling. Nathan initially says, go ahead, the Lord's with you, go ahead and do it. The Lord instructs Nathan to go back and inform David that his timing is different than David's. God's timing was different than David's. God had not requested a house, nor did He need a house. Um, think of this. I mean, can you contain God in a house? No. Um, when Israel was traveling through the wilderness in the Old Testament, how did the Lord manifest His presence to them? He had the Shekinah glory right above the tabernacle. And uh, the pillar of cloud in the day, pillar of fire by night. What do you think was the most noticeable thing about the camp of Israel as they moved through the wilderness? Was it the, was it the tabernacle that they set up and tore down all the time? 
Was it this? I mean, you look at the tabernacle, you look at replicas of the tabernacle. We think of the tabernacle as like as big as this church. It, w- it would fit inside this church easily. It's a very small structure. Um, tabernacle is not a very large structure at all. The courtyard may be um, a little about the size of this church, but the tabernacle itself, very small. What was the defining characteristic of Israel during this time? It was the glory of God. It was the Shekinah glory, the, the, taberna- the uh, pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire, uh, the glory shining down upon this, upon this nation. You can't contain God in a building. And God says, I, I've not asked for a temple. A temple cannot contain Him. He's not asked for it, and so David is not, uh, not to build it. Um, God is going to remind David in 1 Chronicles 22.8, Uh, David will later tell his son Solomon that the Lord had told him that you've shed much blood. David was a man of war. He would yet, if if my chronology is right, David would would continue in his lifetime to fight battle after battle after battle with Israel's enemies and eventually expand, 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 push, expand Israel's territory to its one of its peak uh, heights in their existence. F.B. Meyer said, In this case, the blood-stained hand might not raise the temple of peace. David, as a man of war, as a man who had shed much blood, would not raise the temple of peace. But notice what God calls David. Verses 5 and 8 You see, two times he says, go and tell my servant David. Go and tell my servant David. Say this to my servant David. God treasures his servant David. What do we learn from this? Well, I would say, first of all, we are credited not only with what we do for God, but also with what we desire to do for God. God told David later, you did well that it was in your heart to build me a house. We're credited not only with what we do for God, but also with what we desire to do for God. What do you want to do for the Lord? What does your heart swell with desire to do for the Lord? God sees that. God sees the thoughts of your heart. He sees everything about us. And David is credited with desiring to build a tabernacle for the Lord because he loved the Lord so much. The blessing of God ought to compel us to serve Him with gladness. David looks around and he sees all that the Lord has done for him. He sees, you know, he compares himself now sitting in his house of cedar in his lazy boy chair, if they had those back then. Um, he's sitting there and he's, he's at ease in his house. He's got victory over his enemies. He has a house of cedar and he can run his mind through a chronology of his life, and he can can say, you know, seven years ago, I was in a cave writing psalms of asking the Lord, why have you, where are you, Lord? I was was running from Saul. I was, uh, you know, six years ago, I was on top of a mountain hoping that Saul would not make it uh, to enclose the circle around me and we would be cut off, and the Lord delivered me from the hand of Saul. He can run himself through a chronology of his life. And there's something inside of his heart that desires to bless the Lord and serve the Lord with gladness. And as a young king, David says, I want to build God a palace. I want to build God a palace. He's done so much for me. I want to build him a palace. What do you want to do for the Lord? Young people, what does God, what do you think the Lord wants you to do for him? F.B. Meyer writes, Young people, never surrender your ideal, nor act unworthily of it, nor disobey the heavenly vision. Above all, when you come to the house of cedar and God has given you rest, be more than ever careful to gird yourselves and arise to realize the purpose that visited you when you kept your father's sheep. He's saying, when God blesses your life, you be sure and you remember where you came from. You be sure and you remember what God's done. You be sure and remember the mud that God pulled you out of and you let that swell within your heart and let, you, let it cause you to bless the Lord with all of your heart. And God will credit you not only with what you do for Him but with, but with what you want to do for Him. 
Do you want to serve the Lord? Does the faithfulness of God make your heart swell with gratitude before Him? So David longed to build God a house of cedar. Number two, God built David an eternal house. God's faithfulness to David was the foundation of his future blessing. 2 Samuel 7, 8 here. Thus says the Lord of hosts, middle of the verse, I took you from the sheepfold. He's reviewing David's history from following the, the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. God's faithfulness was the foundation of David's future blessing. God took David when he was a humble shepherd and he exalted him. God gave David scores of victory over his enemies and made him a great man. God would establish Israel in their land and give them lasting victory over their enemies. It says that in verse 10, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. We don't really understand what that meant to David, but to move no more, to have no more unrest, to have no more unsettledness in his, in his country was a great blessing to him. I will do this for Israel. <clears throat> God would establish Israel and their land, give them lasting victory over their enemies. But not only that, God would build a house for David. And by house, here in verse 11, he means a dynasty. God would establish the kingdom of the son that David would conceive in the future. And that son, Solomon, we know, would build a house for God's name. And his kingdom would be established forever. I will establish, verse 13, his kingdom forever. And that son would experience God's parental care. How do parents care for their children? Pa children, how do your parents care for you? What are, what are some things that your parents do for you? Someone under the age of 12 needs to answer this question. What do your parents do for you? Do they, yes. Okay, they serve you meals. Amen. All right. So, so they, pr they provide for you. All right. Um, so they, they provide for your needs. What else do your parents do? Children, what do your parents do when you, when you do something that's wrong? Somebody other than my children. Okay. <laughs> Okay, you, can, you get in trouble when you do something wrong. Because, not because your parents are trying to make life miserable for you, but because your parents love you and they're trying to correct you. They're trying to help you to have the character to make those decisions, those God-pleasing decisions when you're older. So Solomon would, would experience God's parental care, instruction, provision, discipline. God would never take his faithfulness from David's descendants. His throne would be established forever. God says, the, the, the line from your throne, Solomon's son, his son after him, his son after him, I will not take my faithfulness from your descendants. Your throne will be established forever. David's kingdom, secondly, was to be God's kingdom. And David's house was God's house. This is fascinating to me in I'm going to read some verses here. I'm going to read a lot of verses. You can turn to as many as you like. But uh, 1 Chronicles 17, 14 uh, says here, And I will establish him. This is an echo of the Davidic covenant. Uh, there I, I said it again. The covenant with David um, in 1 Chronicles 17, 14. And I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne will be established forever. God says, I will establish Solomon in my house. So David's kingdom is God's kingdom. David's house is God's house. David did not need to construct an impressive but lifeless building in which the Lord could dwell. The Lord had already constructed an impressive building in which to dwell. And that was the life of David. Though the ark resided in a lifeless tent of skin, in a very real sense, the Lord resided in the living tent of David. He says, I'm not going to dwell right now in a house of cedar. I'm going to dwell in your house. I'm going to dwell in your descendants. I will build you a house. Isaiah 16, 5 says, In mercy the throne will be established, and one will sit on it in truth, in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking justice and hastening righteousness. 
What do you think he means when he says the tabernacle of David? The house of David. There will be someone sitting in the house of David, the lineage of David, judging and seeking justice and hastening righteousness. God's faithfulness to David governs the remainder of Israel's history. If you fast forward through Israel's history, if you look at Solomon's reign, his reign is governed by the faithfulness of God to David. In 1 Kings 11, 9 through 13, the Lord is actually angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days. For the sake of your father David, I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. You fast forward to Abijam's reign. We could take every king here. But Abijam's reign in 1 Kings 15, 3 and 4, he says, And he walked, Abijam walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. His heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was his heart of his father David. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem by setting up his son after him and by establishing Jerusalem. Hezekiah's reign. Hezekiah is a good king, but he's surrounded by the Assyrian army, Sennacherib. In 2 Kings 19.34, God says to Hezekiah, For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. This is, this is hundreds of years after David's reign. You have his great, 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 how many, however many greats, uh, grandson, Hezekiah, reigning. And God says, I'll defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And we could continue to go on and on and on. This thing starts here and it goes on and on and on. And you wind up in the New Testament <clears throat> and the children of Israel have known God has promised that David would have an enduring house. He would have an eternal house. And you have in Luke 1.30, when the angel appears to Mary, what does he say? Do not be afraid. You have, been, you have found favor with God. You'll bring forth a son. You'll call his name Jesus. He shall be great, called the Son of the Highest. You know the rest of this verse. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. He'll reign over the house of Jacob forever. In Mark 12, 23, all the multitudes, as they see Jesus, are saying, Could this be the son of David? The son of David. They're referring not to a son of David, but the son of David. They know something about this. Matthew twenty two forty two, 42, Jesus asks the scribes and Pharisees, What do you think about Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, <coughs> They said to him, The son of David. Mark 10, 46 to 48, They came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David. Have mercy on me. He didn't say son of Joseph, son of Mary. He said son of David. They say, be quiet. And he said, cries out the more, son of David, have mercy on me. You could trace this all the way through. The Jews are looking. They know that God's faithfulness to David is going to culminate in something wonderful. Because God's promise to David, our next point is that it implied not only national, but also spiritual Deliverance. God's promise to David implied national and spiritual deliverance. It's like this. The sin of David's house would be defeated by David's son. The sin of David's nation would be defeated by David's son. In Zechariah 12.10, we read, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Isaiah 53, 8 says, He was taken from prison and from judgment and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. The sin of David's nation 
would be defeated by David's son. Not only that, the sin of the entire world would be defeated by David's son. On Easter Sunday, on Easter Sunday, the work of Jesus was finished when He rose from the dead and took His seat at the Father's side. Isaiah 49.6 says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, I am literally just skimming the surface. We could literally stay here till midnight reading all of the passages in the Bible that talk about the house of David and the one that would come from David. I've said nothing about what David wrote of his son that would spring from his own, uh, from, from, uh, his own line. And he writes in Psalm 22 uh, that, oh, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he, he goes through that uh, lament there before the Lord. And that Jesus literally quoted that psalm of his Ancestor from the cross. David says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David is writing this of his son that would come from, from his line. And David and his house realize early on, you can, I, I hope you can begin to see this, the prophecies, we're going to get into more prophecies here in a moment. The prophecies point to a deliverer who will come of the line of David and he'll be a spiritual deliverer, he'll be a physical deliverer. Most importantly, though, he's a spiritual deliverer. Sins will be defeated by David's son. God is building David a house. Lastly here, God invites sinners to a banquet in David's eternal house. God is building David a house and God invites sinners to a banquet in David's eternal house. God's promise to David and his seed impacts the Gentiles, and that's us. Genesis 12, 3, he wrote, he said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We have families here tonight. We have the Fatma family. We have the... the uh, Dietz family, we have the Hamilton family, we have the Linville family. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Isaiah 52, 15, So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. I'd like you to go to Acts 15. Acts 15. I know this is a lot of material to give to you, but I think it will all come together as we go to Acts 15. You see, I still don't see what God's covenant with David has to do with me on Easter. But we're about to see this. Acts 15, 12 through 17. This is at a meeting of the apostles in Jerusalem. Paul and Barnabas have been preaching the word and Gentiles have been saved. Verse 12, Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon, that is Peter, has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. And now he's going to quote the little prophet of Amos. I thought of turning to Amos, but it's easier to find Acts. All right, here, here are the words of Amos. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up. Now, what did he just say? I will, re I will rebuild what? tabernacle of David. It's not the temple, it's the tabernacle of David. It's the house of David, not the house of Solomon, the house of David. So God is going to build David what? A house. If you don't take anything else home, take that tonight. All right, God is building David an eternal house. 
And God is going to rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins. I will set it up so that the rest of mankind, who's the rest of mankind? Gentiles may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these great things. The Gentiles are going to seek God in the tabernacle of David. The Gentiles are going to seek God in the tabernacle of David. They're coming to a banquet, and God's banquet is truly satisfying. I'd like you to turn, you're in Acts now, go to 13, Acts 13. Verse 34, Paul here is preaching in Antioch and Pisidia. And he says to his audience, he's proving to them that God raised Jesus from the dead. He says, and that he raised him, Jesus, from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. I will give you the sure mercies of David. Of David. Now, what does that have to do with the resurrection? Well, Christ's resurrection and His endless life, when will Jesus ever die? Jesus will never die. Christ's resurrection and endless life makes David's house an eternal house because Jesus is the ultimate king of the house of David. God is giving to David an eternal house. Not only that, but Paul is quoting from Isaiah. And I'd like you to turn now to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55 and verse 1. God is giving to David an eternal house. He's creating for David an eternal house. But that house, in that house, He's prepared a banquet for you and me. And He invites us. Look at Isaiah 55, 1. Ho, the Hebrew here is oi, <laughs> All right, you ever heard of oy vey? That's Yiddish for, you know, an exclamation. But oy, ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you, have, you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. It's free. Verse 2. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and a commander for people. Verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. God is inviting all of his hearers here. Ho, everyone that thirsts. Everyone that thirsts. Are you thirsty tonight? Are you hungry? Everyone that thirsts, come, he says. Come to this banquet. All of his hearers, come, be satisfied in his love. He points in verse 2 to the unsatisfying pleasures that consume our time. Today, 2023, Easter Sunday, 2023, there are pleasures in our lives that consume our time that are worthless. And God says, why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me. Eat what is good. Let your soul delight itself in abundance. God says, I want to give you something precious. I want to give you something precious. Okay, Lord, what is it? I will give you the everlasting covenant, the sure mercies of David. He will share with us the eternal blessings that he's promised to David. He said to David back in 1000 B.C., 1000 years before Jesus Christ was ever born, he says to David, I will make your throne last forever. I will make your throne last forever. I will treat your sons as my sons. I will chasten them. I will never take my mercy from your throne. I will faithfully protect your throne forever. 
And the ultimate fulfillment in that is an eternal son of David who will reign forever and ever and who will deliver his people as David delivered Israel and brought unity to Israel and brought deliverance to Israel. David is just a picture of the ultimate son of David who will reign on his throne forever and deliver his people, not only Israel, but Gentile after Gentile after Gentile after sinful Gentile all over this world. And God says to us Gentiles, He says, come, come. I will make a covenant with you. You can get in on this. You want to be in on the covenant with David? I will make a covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. And that covenant was eternally settled on Easter Sunday when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Jesus Christ is our life. His resurrection is not only for Him, it's for me. His resurrection belongs to you, it belongs to me. His death is our death. His resurrection is our resurrection. So, God built David an eternal house. And He invites us sinful Gentiles to a banquet in David's eternal house. And the question tonight is, are you feasting at the banquet that God's prepared? Are you enjoying the faithfulness and the satisfaction of God? How many of you had a marvelous Easter lunch today? Okay, we had a marvelous Easter lunch. And it's at those feast days that, I mean, you've heard the saying, if you leave hungry from a meal like this, it's your own fault. And you just, you eat and you eat and you eat and you enjoy what you eat. And God looks at His people. He looks at people. He looks at sinners and He says in verse 2, Why do you spend money for what is not bread? You're feasting on something that is disgusting. That is spoiled. That's expired. Why are you spending your time and your money on what that which does not profit? And it's possible for people today in 2023 to spend their time and their money on things that do not profit. And God says, I want to give you the faithfulness that I, that I gave to David. That I demonstrated to David on Easter Sunday when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the ultimate son of David. And that I will continue to display to David when Jesus Christ rules on His throne eternally in the future. This verse has everything, this, this covenant, this house of David has everything to do with us. I was struggling with a simple issue of surrender this past week in my own personal life. Not some earth shattering thing, but just something that I was fighting the Lord on. And I came to Isaiah 55 in my study. And verse 2 just, just obliterated the resistance in my heart. Why do you spend your money for what is not bread? And your wages for what is not satisfied. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Let your soul delight itself in abundance. God made a covenant with David and he wants to share that covenant with me. He wants to share that covenant with you. Do you have any idea about the joy that God wants to share with you? Or are you feasting on the junk food of this world? You know, it is, it is insane to eat cheese doodles when you have a steak sitting in front of you. Okay? Now some of you can debate that all you want, but it is insane to eat cheese doodles when you have a steak sitting in front of you. Or substitute the meal of your choice, all right? And you you're hungry and you fill up, you fill yourself up on cheese doodles or even worse the little peeps that they sell at, at Easter time, okay? Terrible, terrible things. Um, you know, um, how many are with me on that? Anybody? Okay, nobody? okay several. Um, why would you fill yourself up with that when you have your Easter meal? God says, why do you fill yourself with this stuff? Look at what I've done with David. Look at my faithfulness to David down through the years. See what I can do in your life. David's worship lastly, is a pattern for all who are amazed at God's grace. I'd like you to turn to one final passage here, 1 Chronicles 17. 1 Chronicles 17. What is David's response to this? 
Look in verse 16. Then David went in and sat before the Lord. He just sits there. He sat before the Lord. After the Lord spoke all these things to him, he sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Jehovah God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? He's amazed by God's grace. You know, God's grace is always supposed to be amazing. And if you're not amazed by God's grace tonight, you're amazed at something else. Mark it down. If you're not amazed by God's grace tonight, you're amazed by something else. You're amazed by some cheap football team. You're amazed by some cheap political leader. You're amazed by some cheap fiction book that you're into. You're amazed by some cheap movie that you're you're excited about. You're amazed by some music that you're into. You're amazed by something else other than God's grace. God's grace is always supposed to amaze us. And David sits there. And he says, who am I that you have regarded me? Who is my family? What more can I say? Verse 18, what more can I say, Lord? What more can David say before you? I love the end of this verse. For you know your servant. You know my wickedness. You know my heart. You know your servant. Verse 20, there is none like you, O Lord. There's There's no other God like this. There's no other God that when you try to build him a house, he says, no, 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 no. You can't build a house big enough for me, but I'll tell you what I'll do. You can't outgive me, so I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to establish my faithfulness with you forever because I give credit not only to what you do for me, but what you want to do for me. There's no other God like that. Why Why would you eat? Why would you feast upon the things of the world when you can feast upon a God like that? That's the thrust of of this message tonight. In verse 22, you have made your people Israel your own people forever, and you, O Lord, have become their God. Now, has God been their God for these hundreds of years past? Yes, He has, but now He's become their God. Now He's their God. Now, this is, this is real. God's faithfulness is palpable. It's real to these people. Verse 23, do as you have said. Now, O Lord, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant, concerning his house, let it be established forever and do as you have said. It's appropriate to call upon God to fulfill his promises. What do we take away from this? David wanted to build God a house of cedar. God says to David, I will build you an eternal house. Your throne will last forever. It will culminate in my son coming to earth. David didn't realize all of this, I don't think, at at that point. God builds David an eternal house, and God turns in Isaiah 55, and he says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come, I will make a covenant with you. You can participate in my covenant with David. I make his house to last forever. I make his reign to last forever and you can be a part of that covenant. You can participate in that sure and everlasting covenant. And God's invitation to us is come and be satisfied. Come and be satisfied. What does God's promise to David have to do with us tonight? Literally everything. That's why we're here. We're here because God kept his promises to David. That's why we're here. And God turns and He says, I want to include you. I want you to experience the blessing of that promise. And may God help us to turn from the things of this world and be truly satisfied in Him. Let's pray. Lord, this has been a lot of material, a lot of facts, a lot of verses. Lord, I trust that your word will not return to you void. Pray that you would amaze us by your faithfulness to us, by your goodness to us. Lord, we deserve none of it. We deserve nothing from you. We deserve everything the opposite of what you've given to us. Lord, what more can we say to you? 
Lord, make us thankful. Make us worship you. Make us to be truly amazed. Lord, if there are things in our lives that pull us away from being amazed by your grace, Lord, deliver us from them. Lord, our country, our world need us to be amazed by you, to share your glory and declare your glory among the nations. I pray for some young people here tonight, perhaps, that, Lord, need to be arrested by your glory and the faithfulness that you display, not only to David, but to us. Lord, work in our hearts, work in all of our hearts, what, whatever our age, and make us faithful to you. Help us to walk worthy of what you've done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.